uh, so I'm going to do a lot of background of this case. Um, I'm going to do a, uh, because I really want to set the stage. If you're interested in the story of Loving Lee, Virginia, um, there was a pretty decent movie made uh, two or three years ago, just simply entitled Loving, um, that follows the story um, uh, of what goes on in this case and go obviously puts a dramatic turn on it. Not that, as you'll hear from the discussion of the facts, there really needed to be any uh, dramatic window dressing to make the story... Um, interesting uh so again uh the state of virginia and again like many other states but this this case arises from the state of virginia um precluded interracial marriage and therefore had a law that criminalized uh, marrying outside of your own race um in this case uh specifically two residents of virginia one white and one black were married in the district of columbia pursuant to the District of Columbia's laws in 1958, which is to say that they were legally married in a jurisdiction which recognized their right to marry. Um, shortly after they were married, they returned to Virginia and continued to live in you know, wedded bliss. Um, shortly they af thereafter, this time, uh, they were charged with violating Virginia's ban on interracial marriage. Uh, they pled guilty. Um, and each was sentenced to one year in jail. However, the trial judge um, suspended the sentence for a period of 25 years on one condition. That condition being that the Lovings leave the state and not return to Virginia for 25 years. Um, in sentencing the couple um, to this probationary term, um, this is what the trial judge said. Almighty God created the races white, black, yellow, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. And, but for the interference with his arrangement, there would be no cause for such a marriage. The fact that he separated the races shows that he did not intend for the races to mix. So you can see exactly the environment we're working in. Um, after abiding by this ruling for five years, um, which means they were not residing in Virginia, um, in 1963, they filed a motion in uh, state trial court to vacate the judgment and set aside the sentence um, on the ground that the statute in question uh, violated the 14th Amendment. They waited nearly a year, um, during which time their motion was entirely disregarded. Um, even in the state of Virginia, there's a 60-day waiting period in which mo motions have to be decided. A year has gone by. The 60-day window is completely, um, has completely passed. Uh, so they move to the federal court um, and, and they file a case in the federal court uh, in an attempt to have their convictions uh, vacated. Um, before that case can actually be heard, the trial court makes a decision. So they waited forever to hear from the state trial court. They threw their hands up in the air and said, well, we'll just go to federal court instead. Uh, and in the time before the federal court actually had sat to hear the case, uh, the trial court at the state level made its decision against the Lovings. Um, the Lovings then appealed their case to the Virginia Supreme Court. Um, the federal district court stays their action. So the federal district court was moving forward. They stayed their action waiting for uh, the Virginia Supreme Court to weigh in. Uh, the Virginia Supreme Court upholds the constitution constitutionality of anti-miscegenation statutes um, and modifies the sentence, but affirms the conviction. Um, they then appeal to the Supreme Court, which takes the case. Um, you have to understand the procedural history here is important. It takes about five years um, from the initial start of the case, and I don't mean the initial case in which uh, uh, in which they were found in violation of the anti-miscegenation laws, but from the point that they start their suit to the point it ends, it's a five-year period. There's an important thing that happens in those five years. And that's really the success of the civil rights movement. Um, so the issue uh, in this case was whether Virginia's ban on interracial marriage violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court held that it was in violation and reversed the convictions. The state of Virginia 
uh, argued that this law was different from other anti-miscegenation laws in the country um, because it subjected both um, those individuals who were African-American and those individuals who were right to the same penalty. Um, traditionally, these laws only penalized the African-American spouse. Um, in most cases, the white spouse received no punishment. So Virginia argued that it wasn't discriminating on the basis of race because it was criminalizing both the African-American um, spouse and the white spouse, which is, I, it's an argument that someone apparently had the balls enough to make. Um, the Supreme Court rejects that argument out completely out of hand and says that, no, this is still invidious discrimination because it is based on race. Two individuals who are white are married to, aren't subject to this law. Two individuals who are African-American are married aren't subject to this law. So clearly the distinction is made upon race, even though you're criminalizing both parties. Um, the purpose and motivation of this law clearly exists to keep the races separate. And we only need to go back so far as to see the trial court's decision. It's not like we have to ask a question about why this law is in existence. Um, but the Supreme Court really isn't done there. Uh, they keep going. Um, they argued that the 14th Amendment's purpose uh, was to eliminate uh, state sources of invidious discrimination, even if the framers of the 14th Amendment had not intended it uh, to invalidate anti-miscegenation laws. Um, so the court says, no, there, there's, a, there's a fundamental right to marry. It exists, it's in the 14th Amendment, or it exists in the 14th Amendment. Um, and so coupling Skinner together with this, we have this notion of there exist fundamental rights. And these fundamental rights are subject, when they are removed from a person, when they are denied to a person by a government, then you have to meet strict scrutiny in order to do that. Um, now, this notion of a fundamental right is interesting. So when we look at the other amendments of the Constitution, um, that we know that the freedom of speech, for example, if you violate someone's freedom of speech, then the law in question that violates that, that freedom of speech uh, has to be subject to, to, to strict scrutiny. Um, but when the Supreme Court identifies something as being a fundamental right. They're basically adding things to the Constitution um, because that's the functional practice about how these things are ultimately play out. Um, there is really not, uh, there, there's no resistance to say um, at the time or really now that marriage is a fundamental right we all sort of recognize that as a fundamental right there isn't a large amount of um dissent among the populace that marriage is a fundamental right by the same token uh there isn't a large amount of dissent about i don't know the right to privacy we all sort of recognize that the right to privacy is probably something the the founders assumed uh, that all of us had. And therefore, we all subscribe to the notion that the right to privacy is, is a good thing. Uh, so it's really not controversial when these things are, 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 are added to the Constitution. But the method by which they're added to the Constitution, the steps that are taken to add them to the Constitution should shock you in that it seems fairly easy. And if you can read rights into the Constitution fairly easily, what it means is that no state can regulate against those rights. So right to privacy, that, that's a good one. Well, what happens if you add, I don't know, uh, birth control? So birth control now becomes a, falls under the right to privacy. So birth control has a constitutional right to exist. Well, it isn't a far stretch to move to abortion. It isn't a far stretch to move from there exists a fundamental right to marriage, that there exists a fundamental right um, for same-sex marriage. 
And I'm not to argue that I don't agree patently with all of those things, because I do. The difference is, when a court reads them into the Constitution, the only way to do away with them is to amend the Constitution. Um, so this is should be seen as an exceedingly strong power of the court um, that really doesn't have any effective or functional check within society. We know that amending the Constitution is, is something that most likely will not happen um, in most conditions. And, and so you could have a court that is wildly out, outside the step of um, the population as a whole that could read rights into the Constitution that, well, maybe the founders didn't intend for there to be there, um, certainly are not supported by the population at mass, and that becomes dangerous. Um, and, and while there seems to be overwhelming agreement that yes, marriage is a fundamental right, that we all share in that. Procreation is a fundamental right, and we all generally agree uh, on that. When you start making the deviations and steps down to um, birth control is a fundamental right, abortion is a fundamental right, same-sex marriage is a fundamental right, you can see that it, these can get controversial very quickly. And so we're going to talk to at least in some extent um, going forward about what this process is, what it's actually called, um, and how courts can use uh, a thing called substantive due process to read rights into the Constitution.